Oh, good morning, everybody. My name is Chris Quinn. I'm the youth pastor here. Uh, we have been going through a series called Last Words as we study through the book of 2 Peter. But I want to start by talking about my favorite movie of all time. And it's a movie called The Shawshank Redemption. And if you, yeah, I like that response. Yeah. If you've seen it, you know what I'm talking about. This is an amazing movie. And if you haven't seen it yet, I highly recommend it. Just forewarning, it's kind of it's a, it's, it's a hard story, but it's about this man. It's actually written by Stephen King. It's a short story about a man named Andy Dufresne who believes he is falsely accused of murdering his wife and uh, the man that she was having an affair with. And so this story, he comes into prison and it's this notoriously tough prison in the middle of the, of the depression era in Maine. And he meets this man named Red, played by Morgan Freeman, of course, and they strike up this friendship and they become really great friends. But as their friendship kind of continues, Andy gets it to this point where he kind of gets in trouble for something, but he says he hold, he's holding on to hope, holding on to something on, uh, that there is something from the outside world. They can't take this from you. And this gets Red really upset. This gets him angry. And this is what he says about hope. Hope is a dangerous thing. Hope can drive a man insane. It's got no use on the inside. You better get used to that idea. And without spoiling the movie because it's too good, let's just say Andy wins this particular argument and says to him later, hope is a good thing, maybe the best of things, and no good thing ever dies. You see, for Christians, the idea of hope is something that we can stake our lives upon, that we know is as certain of anything that we might find in our world. It's not like the cultural version of hope where we might say, I hope to get married someday. I hope to have children. I hope to have a time to retire in a specific place that I'm going to retire. Or I hope to go to this college someday. It's this loose hope that our culture believes in, and it might not actually happen. But in terms of the Bible and the story of Scripture, Hope is a certain thing. It is absolutely going to happen is as certain as the sunrise. And we need to have this understanding of hope, particularly when we think about Jesus returning someday. Because again, hope is truly one of the best things in our world and one of the best things in our faith because it should lead us to lead, live godly lives as we wait for Jesus to return. And so this morning, we're going to look at four hopes that the return of Christ provides for us. And here's what they are. Christ's return gives us the hope that God is actively involved in human history, that God is waiting for more to repent, that it elicits joy for the believer and urges us to continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of of Jesus Christ. And so I invite you to turn to 2 Peter chapter 3. We'll be going through the whole chapter. There's a lot to cover this morning. And if you don't have a Bible, grab the brown hard cover back in the seat in front of you. Turn to page 1227. And again, I want to remind us always whenever we are looking at a book of the background of it so we know where the author is coming from. And Peter is, has written to a collection of churches in Asia Minor. He's trying to restore order because these false teachers had come in. They were denying that Jesus was ever going to return and that as a result we could live however we wanted to live pursuing whatever pleasures we wanted to because there was no coming judgment but Peter is constantly saying that we are to live godly and holy lives and that we have been given everything we need from Christ in order to do that and we need to reject and move and stay away from what these false teachers were teaching so let's go ahead and read starting in verse 1 Dear friends, this is now my second letter to you. I have written both of them as reminders to stimulate to you to wholesome thinking. I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Savior through your apostles. Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming he promised? Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also, the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. So he starts by calling them this term of endearment. He says, dear friends, and it's kind of actually too soft to just say dear friends. What he's saying here is this word beloved. 
And when we think of this word beloved, he's talking to the church and it's, it kind of gives the concept of God's love that he has given to us through his salvation that he has provided and that we are deeply loved by God and cherished by him. And that is the same for Peter. He deeply loves these people. And so they are the beloved. And he says it's his second letter he's written and actually it would be quite, it's actually surprising that I could say this, but it's actually quite hard to prove this, that First Peter is the first letter and Second Peter is the second letter. You'd be surprised at how hard it is to actually prove that, but that's most likely what he is talking about here. And then he says that he has written both of these letters as reminders, something to stimulate the thinking, to arouse their thinking, not to uh, insult their intelligence by reminding them of something that they already know, but to arouse their thinking into what he says, wholesome thinking. Wholesome meaning what is pure and right and good. And the thing that is the most pure and right and good in our world is the gospel, that God deeply loved us and that he sent his son to die on the cross on our behalf so that we may have life in him, true life in him. And that this gospel should overwhelm our thinking so much that it would energize us to live for the glory of God and to grip our whole person in its captivating power, that God loved us this deeply, that God loves us so much and God would give us this new life. And so he says he wants them to recall the words spoken and by the prophets in the past, because this is something that goes back to chapter one towards the end where he starts talking about these prophets and what they were saying was that there was a coming Messiah and Peter is saying this coming Messiah is Jesus. He fulfilled all the things that were said in the Old Testament by the prophets, but that also there was this command given by Jesus himself to live holy and upright lives. This is something that Jesus said all the time, but now it's been passed on through the apostles. And so he's teaching them these things so that they wouldn't fall prey to the false teachers who say something completely different than what the prophets and apostles were saying. That's why he's reminding them of these things so that they don't fall prey to it. They don't give in to it. But he says, above all, you must understand. And so above all, this is like his, his thing he's trying to really hit on the most in this passage is that there will be scoffers that will come in the last days and that the last days were actually started when Jesus returned. And the reason we say it that way is because calling it the last days, meaning that at any time Jesus could come and return and basically end this whole thing and bring all of what he has talked about into full completion is because it can happen at any time. There's an urgency, and we'll talk about the importance of this urgency later on, but that these false teachers, they're going to come around, and it's proving that the end is near, and that they are scoffing, they are mocking, they're ridiculing, and most likely what they are ridiculing is the idea that Jesus would ever possibly return. And so they would instead pursue their own pleasures rather than living this holy life that was called upon by Jesus. So then we get to verse 4 and we see kind of what the false teachers were actually probably teaching. So the first line, they said, they will say, where is this coming he promised? When we hear that word coming, it's this word in Greek called parousia. And it gives us the concept of a ruler or a king who is coming to arrive at a town. And so Jesus promised that he would come, and now they're scoffing at this. They're saying, where is this coming he promised? He's been long coming. He hasn't come yet. But then they make this interesting argument that when you understand it, what they're saying, you can see how, you can immediately think of how ridiculous it actually is. They would, these false teachers were saying, Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. Basically saying, ever since the beginning of God creating everything, God has not touched this world. He has not been involved in anything whatsoever. He has not intervened. And so as a result, he will not intervene later by coming down and bringing this coming judgment. And we can already immediately think of Peter is probably flabbergasted by this idea that they would even say this. And so what he says is, and instead of thinking of the phrase, but they deliberately forget, it's actually better to translate it as, for when they maintain this idea, it escapes their notice. That they, when they maintain this idea that God hasn't intervened in all of creation, all of history since creation, they, they fail to notice something very important. First of all, that God long ago by his word, the heavens and earth came into being. That God simply said, let there be light, let there be sky, let there be animals, let there be sea creatures. Simply by his word, he created all of what we see. And that the earth was formed out of water. It's very important for us to understand that the concept in Genesis 1 
verse two, is that the earth, it says the earth was formless and void, basically meaning it was this watery chaos that it could not possibly inhabit human or any other kind of life. And so what God did is by forming the earth out of water, he basically formed it so that it could inhabit inhabit human and animal and plant life. It could house life here on this earth and that God is the one who initiated it simply by his word, but that he also used water. He was formed out of water and by water, but water was one of the uh, instruments he used in order to create this world. But then in contrast, as we see in verses six and seven, God used this word that he created and the water that he used to create, he uses the same things in order to bring judgment on the world for its deeds. And he says, by these waters, also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. He's basically saying that you can't say that God hasn't intervened because the flood shows that he intervened. God stepped in and said, I am done with the wickedness and the evil of this world. And so I'm going to send a flood. So by the same water he used to create the world, he's now using it to bring the judgment on the world. And then he says, by the same word, that he used, you know, to create life, he's now used, he's going to use it eventually to bring, as he says here, it's reserved, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire. Basically, there, God is holding on and waiting for that time when it's the right time. He can't use water again because he promised that he would not do that from Genesis chapter 9, but now he's saying it's going to be reserved for fire. Fire is going to be the tool and that this or heavens and earth are being kept, basically being put on layaway. God is waiting. He is storing up the time he's being, and it's, as we'll see later, he's being patient and waiting for more to come to repentance before he brings the day of the Lord, the day of judgment, where everybody's deeds are going to be brought to account before God, whether they are wicked or whether they are righteous. And on that day, it means judgment and destruction for the wicked, unfortunately, but also salvation for those who have put their faith in Christ. So you have a little bit of both going on here, but that if those who don't repent, it will, as verse seven says, bring the destruction of the ungodly. And so what we see when we, when we look through all of this is that God is actively involved in all of his creation. And so this is our first hope that Christ's return reveals that God continually intervenes throughout human history. We can't buy into this lie that God is not at constant work in our lives and in the activities of all of human history. Listen to this from Daniel chapter 2, verses 21 through 22. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells with him. If God is active in all of these ways, which is almost an all-encompassing activity of his, then he's, he's involved in everything. He's involved in absolutely everything that is in the world and throughout all of human history, but he's not just involved in the overarching things of all of human history. He's also involved in the intimate things in history and intimate into our lives, into our hearts, into our, our personal world, because it says in Psalm 139 that God is intimately acquainted with all of our ways. He knows every single one of our daily activities. He knows, and he even knows everything that we hold onto on the inside that we don't want other people to see, our fears, our worries, our doubts, doubts, our failures, weaknesses, sins, but he wants to be involved in every single one of those. He wants to know us intimately and deeply. And that really, the idea of Christ returning accomplishes a couple of things for us to let us know about the character of who God is and why there's such a great hope. First of all, that God wants to fully and completely deal with evil and to to be a just God and to take care of it. That is something that is at his heart. But he also wants to do that within us. He wants to deal with the evil that is within our own hearts and not just like to punish it, but to also re- to truly redeem it so that we become new transformed people because what the return of Christ inaugurates is a total transformation of our old selves into a glorified new body that is without pain, without sin and weaknesses and doubt and fear, disease, sorrow, addictions as we come before him face to face. All of this will be completely gone and we will be completely transformed, as Paul says, in the blink of an eye. It'll be so fast and all of those things will be gone and that is our great hope that God is intimately involved with all of his creation. Let's continue verse 8. 
But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. So he doesn't want them to forget something that's very crucial and important to understand at this point, especially because of the argument that the false teachers were making, questioning whether Jesus was going to return. He says this, with with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years are like a day. He's quoting something from Psalms 90 verse 4, where it says, for a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it is past or as a watch in the night. Because what some people have done is taken this verse and use it as a formula to like give us a timeline of when Jesus will return or how long the earth is going to be around. And that's not the point of what Peter is saying here. What he's actually saying, he's talking more about God's patience. And that truly, that God doesn't, isn't affected by our concepts of time whatsoever. So the passage of time for us doesn't affect him. And truly, that he, what Peter is doing, he's making a contrast with the e- eternity of God and the impatience of human beings, in particular, these false teachers. And so that truly, Christ will return at some point, but, his, but God's timing of it completely transcends our understanding of time, especially when it comes to this idea of God being slow. Is that the Lord, he says, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise. He's trying to reassure the people this is not something that God is being slow in. He's waiting. And, and he says, as some understand slowness, and the some is, is the false teachers, they might understand that it's, they think that, it's being, that God is being slow, but he's not. He's not slow playing this at all. He's waiting. And it says, instead, he is patient with you. He's not wanting anyone to perish. That God is being patient in his timing. He's waiting for people to come to a place where they say, I I am a sinner before God and I need his grace. I need his forgiveness. I need to be redeemed from my old self into a new life in Christ. And this is something that it says that God is patient and that that his primary idea here is that he doesn't want anyone to perish. This actually goes back to something that Ezekiel says in the Old Testament that he says that God does not take pleasure in the death of the wicked but that God's desire is that people would repent. They would say, I am a sinner. I have done this. This is my fault. I am the one who is deserving of this punishment. But God's grace is so great and saves us if we put our faith in Christ. And that God's ultimate, like his primary desire when it, when it comes to whether God acts in judgment on wicked or on the wicked or acts in grace upon those who have come to salvation, God's primary desire is to act in grace. This is what he wants to do. This is what he he desires for everyone to come to repentance. And so he's being patient. He's waiting. He's biding his time for people to come to repentance. But he makes sure to say that, but remember, the day of the Lord will come like a thief. It's something that Jesus said in Matthew 24. And so truly, we can't expect when Jesus is going to come. We can't predict it. We don't know for sure. And if anybody tries to, they're either lying or they're truly very deceived to think that they can predict it. But we can be prepared for it, and we'll see later, to be prepared in a way of living a holy and godly life. And so he then starts to describe a little bit about what this coming judgment's going to look like. He first says, the heavens will disappear with a roar. The sky and space will completely disappear. And it says, with a roar, what he actually, that word we can, it's a, like a literal like hearing of the crackling of a fire. It's kind of an interesting concept that we would hear. And so that's how the heavens are going to be destroyed. We're going to hear that's cr- going to be this crackling fire. And he says, the elements will be destroyed by fire. The elements are things like earth air, fire, and water, these things, it's going to be such a total destruction that even the elements, the building blocks of this world are going to be destroyed. And then that everything and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. It's a complete and total destruction. But what's going to happen is it's going to reveal things. And like it says, laid bare, things are going to be found out. Deeds that we have done in our lives and all of people throughout all of human history, all the deeds done on the earth will be revealed and will be found out. And it's really important for us to understand that this is what's going to happen. All of our deeds are going to be revealed and be found out. And this is part of what God is doing here. And when we see the concept, it's kind of going back to this idea of refining fire. If you know the concept, how you refine a metal, you don't necessarily always find a 
pure sample in the ground, if you're like looking for something like silver, what you need to do is truly get as close to what you got there, set it on fire, like put it and get it really hot, get that fire really hot and that it'll burn away the dross in it. So what that's going to do is it's going to reveal where things are dross, where things are, uh, where there's wickedness, where there's evil. And that's what God's going to do. It's kind of a terrifying thing if you really think about it. But this leads us to our second hope is that Christ's return is delayed because he's waiting for more people to repent. It is said numerous times throughout the Bible that the Lord knows who are his. He knows who's going to repent and he has yet to return because he's being patient. He's waiting for those people who have yet to repent to do so, to to take up his offer of forgiveness. And we have to remember that as well, that God is a very patient God, that he could have acted quicker than he did, but he was, he waited. Here's some examples. First of all, he waited for 400 years during Israel's enslavement before he enacted his judgment on the nation of Israel and even still gave them chances to repent. He waited for hundreds of years for the Canaanites to repent of their sin before God brought Israel in as his instrument to bring judgment upon what they were doing. He waited for hundreds of years before he brought the punishment and just, justice onto the nation of Israel for their sin and brought in Assyria and Babylon to take them into exile. We have a tendency to focus on the judgment of God and be really uncomfortable with that idea that God would act in this way, but we also tend to forget that God's, about God's patience in waiting for these people to repent, to turn away from their wickedness and even especially his patience with us. I know God has been extremely patient with me in my life and in all of our lives. And remember, this is God's primary desire. He would rather be patient and show grace and mercy to anyone. Even if you think of the worst of the worst in our world, in our history, like Hitler, Bin Laden, Hussein, Stalin, some of these horrible people in our history, God would have much rather have them repented than to have acted in the way that he has presumably with them, and that is in justice and judgment for what they have done. And so let's continue. Verse 11. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. He writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction." So he's, he's going back a little bit. He's connecting to verse 10 a little bit. He says, since everything will be destroyed in this way, and we actually have to clarify for a second here about what he means by this way, because there's actually two different ways to interpret how he is going to go about destroying the, earth, the heavens and the earth. One is to take it extremely literally and that it is a full-on complete destruction starting over and bring out a new heavens and a new earth. Uh, The other option is that God is actually doing this massive renovation and restoration project on the earth and that he is going to restore things back to the way that he intended them to be when he created it at the very start. And actually, based on what the rest of scripture says, and I'll just say this right now, this is my personal opinion. I actually think the second one's the better option. I think it makes more sense that God would try and seek to redeem and restore what he has created because that's what he does with us. He seeks to redeem and restore and transform us as we are so that we would look like Christ someday. And I think that's exactly what he's doing here. And Christ even says, I'm making all things new. He's restoring them back. But you can believe the other option. It's totally possible, totally plausible. I'm just saying this is truly my opinion because either way, no matter how you split between those two, Either way, there will someday be a new heavens and a new earth where we will be physically in our glorified bodies before God, where our transformed bodies that he has been promising to us. And so he says, as a result of knowing this information, that this destruction is coming, what kind of lives, what kind of people ought you to be? And this is what he says, 
you ought to live holy and godly lives. This goes back to chapter one where he says you've been given everything you need to live a godly life and that you can participate in God's divine nature, meaning you can become like God, that God is going to transform you so that you re reflect him and that you fully represent him in bearing his image and that this is what we need to be living like, and we'll see why when we get to verses 13 and 14, why we need to be living like this. But then he says, as you look forward, as you look ahead to the day of God, remember that coming judgment, whether for the, you know, punishment for the wicked or salvation for the righteous, as we look forward to this, to a, look at what he says, to the, and speed it's coming. I don't think it's necessarily like the statement of, well, right now God's plan is to come at this point in history, but if we all live holy, godly lives, then that's going to move it this way, move it closer and closer. I don't think that's what he means. I think what he's saying is just kind of perspective that we are trying to bring God's kingdom here onto this earth and so that it seems as if God is coming closer. And he says that this day where God will come is going to bring destruction of the heavens by fire. He's kind of rehashing what he said again in verse 10 and that the elements will melt in the heat. He says, but in keeping with this promise, with God keeping his promise to come of Jesus returning, we are looking forward, and this is the culmination of it, to a new heaven and earth, look at this, where righteousness dwells. This is where the beauty of what he was talking about of of, of Jesus coming again is that he's going to destroy everything that is all wicked and so everything that has been ruling in with, with wickedness and evil will no longer rule. It will be God's perfect righteousness. Holy standard of righteousness will be ruling and reigning forever. There will be no more sin. There will be no more death but God will be ruling on his throne and it will be and righteousness will be there. That is an incredible, beautiful hope that we can imagine at that point someday. It's going to be an amazing thing that we'll, we'll get to see. So he says, so then, because this new heaven and new earth are coming, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. The reason that we should try and seek and live these holy, spotless, blameless lives is because we're trying to live as if that is the reality right now, and that what we are doing is we are basically saying, I'm going to live this life because this is what is is coming. This is what God wants for us already, so I'm going to start doing it right now. And we have to understand that being spotless and blameless and at peace with God, it's, it's a non-negotiable when it comes to spending eternity with Jesus. We can't come to God in the middle of our sin. We can't, because our sin makes us impure. And so what has to happen is when we put our faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit comes into our lives and makes us spotless and blameless, washes us clean of all of our sin, all of our unrighteousness, so that we can be spotless and blameless before him. It is a work only he can do. And it's something that he does when we put our faith in him. But he also reminds us that, verse 15, that to, to bear in mind, to regard that our Lord's patience means salvation, that God is, because he's being patient, that it means salvation, that 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 he's being patient and waiting for more and more to come to repentance. But then he kind of goes on to this aside of talking about Paul. And I think the reason he's talking about Paul here is because he's correcting something the false teachers were saying about Paul. Most likely they were saying something along the lines of, well, Paul says we are free in Christ, so now we can go do whatever we want. So what ba Peter basically says here is, no, no, no. Paul agrees with what I'm saying because he's an apostle. He, he agrees exactly with what I'm saying and that we should live holy and godly lives. We shouldn't live in that way where we pursue whatever pleasures that we want. And that truly what's happening is they are distorting what Paul is teaching. They're not, they don't understand it. And we could dive into this a little bit more, but really Peter is just making it very clear. Don't distort Paul. He believes the same things that I do. We are in agreement on this, and you can't distort and twist it like they might do with other scriptures. And so this carries into our third hope, that Christ's return should elicit joy in his people because his righteousness will rule forever. When we look at everything we see here, he keeps saying, as you look forward to the day, this should, should give us something to be excited about for those of us who are in Christ because no longer will evil rule in our world, but Christ's perfect righteousness will reign. No more wickedness, no more evil, no more sin, no more death or sorrow or disease or sickness or weakness or pain or trial or temptation. All of it will be completely gone. 
And yes, there could be a little bit of a, a tinge of sadness because we think about those who didn't repent, who didn't take the opportunity that God gave to them. But at the same time, there's this overwhelming joy knowing that we will be fully rescued and redeemed out of this broken, fallen, and sinful world and be brought face to face with Jesus Christ who loved us enough to die on the cross for our sins, that we would see our Savior face to face. This is an incredible hope that we have. But if you are a person who has not put your faith in Christ, this day, this coming day of the Lord is something to be feared because our sins must be dealt with and that Jesus Christ gives the opportunity to completely cover over every single one of those sins that you are, so that you are right with God. It's not necessarily as well fire insurance, but a commitment to say, I am yours, God. I am going to live for you. And so today is as good of any as, as to say to God, I've sinned. I'm the one who's made a mess of my life. I'm the one who has chosen to do these things. And Jesus, I recognize that you have paid the price for my sin, that if I believe in you, it covers over all of my sin, and that you want to righteously redeem me. You want to bring me into a new place with you and so that I can follow you with the rest of my life, that I give my life completely to you. And so don't, don't just hear this as a, uh, you know, as a, as someone who needs to hear this for the first time, but if you are, if you've been a Christian for your whole life, you can hear this as an opportunity is to say, I'm going to recommit my life as well. And so let's continue. Let's go to the last two verses. Therefore, dear friends, since you have been forewarned, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of the lawless and fall from your secure position, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. And so again, he calls them beloved, but we always have to look at that phrase where he says, therefore. We always ask the question, what is the therefore, therefore? And he's doing that because of what he has just talked about. Therefore, because of everything I've just said about this coming judgment, he says, you have been forewarned. He said, you can't plead ignorance now that I'm going to return. I've told you, or that Jesus is going to return. I've told you it's coming, Peter says. And so as a result of this, what they need to do is this, and the translation would actually probably be better put as this. Be on your guard so that you do not fall away by being carried away by the error of the lawless men. It goes back to what we talked about last week where the, the false teachers were using appeals to the desires of the flesh, is what he says, as the bait and hook. So this statement of you can pursue whatever pleasures that you want, living a lifestyle without rules, without barriers, you can do whatever you want. That was the bait and hook that they would pull people in. So he's saying be on your guard so that you can recognize false teachers for who they are, what they teach, what they're doing, and you would be able to stay away and be able to be stand firm, to be grounded and not fall for their traps, not fall for their lies. But instead, what we ought to be doing is to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And this statement is actually a bookend from the very, very beginning of this letter. And that these two things kind of show that this is what Peter was talking about for the whole thing. That he wants his people to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that this will protect them from falling into the lies of the false teachers and to remember and to live in the urgency that Christ could return truly at any moment. And it's grace in the idea of God bestowing his sustaining and enabling grace so that we can live for him in this world and be able to obey him and to listen to him and to, be, and to grow in this every single day. And then this knowledge is this intimate knowledge of knowing Jesus. It's not just head knowledge, which is also very important, but this deep knowledge of saying, I'm going to know Jesus personally and intimately so that I can grow. Because here's the reality. Growing in Christ is not an optional thing. Growing to know him closer, it's a necessity for the survival of a follower of Christ. Because I've seen this, I've had too much experience in ministry, and I know this, that one who does not cultivate a closer relationship with Christ is a Christian who will inevitably falter. I have seen it time and time again. So cultivate it. Do it out of the grace that Jesus has given you to be able to do it. Because remember, we have been given everything we need to live a godly life. And so Peter closes the letter and he says to him, to Jesus, be glory, be honor, be, be all the praise for what has happened here, what he has done both now and forever. Amen. And so this leads us to our fourth hope is that Christ's return keeps us on guard to grow in his grace and in the knowledge of him. Because we don't know when Christ will return, we are to be constantly ready at any moment for it to happen. 
And truly, it's important that we understand that this is actually a gift that God has given us about this urgency. Because if we, I think human nature, if we knew when Jesus would return, we would be extremely complacent. And we would put off the call that God has called us to do. We would put off living holy and godly lives. We'd put off sharing the gospel with people. We'd put off growing our relationship with him because we know there's a deadline. I know that's what I would do because I am a very serious procrastinator with my life. Uh, but with that, and so really the, the urgency forces us to recognize that we need to do all these things, that we need to grow in our relationship with him, that we need to live the godly lives and share the gospel with people. And so we need to be ready. We need to be prepared at all times, living godly lives, sharing the gospel and growing in our relationship with him. And so that we remember and remember that we have been given everything we need to live this godly life. God's grace sustains us and gives us the ability. And so truly start doing it today. Don't wait. Live in the urgency that Christ could return truly at any moment. And so let's live holy and godly lives like Peter has said. So I truly think I must be an old soul in some ways because whenever I think of stuff like this, my mind goes to hymns. And the one I think of is, it is well with my soul, particularly the last verse where it says, And Lord, haste the day when my faith shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. It is well with our souls as we wait for Christ's return because we have great hope that Christ's promise is certain that he will return. It is this incredible hope. And so I want to close by asking these two questions. How will you live now in urgency, knowing that Christ could return at any moment? How are you going to live that now? How are you going to be prepared? How are you going to be on guard? And lastly, how will you, know, how will you live now that you know that Christ's return is this absolute certain hope? And so let's not forget our four things we learned this morning. That Christ's return gives us the hope that God is actively involved in human history. That God is waiting for more to repent. It elicits joy for the believer and urges us to continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ. Let's pray. God, we're just so thankful that you are patient and that you give us the time to repent, to come to a place of relationship with you. And God, that your primary desire is to act in grace and mercy upon people. But God, that you are a just and good God and you must deal with evil in order for this new future to be made available. And so Jesus, we pray for our service. We thank you that we have the ability to be here to worship you. We love you and we give this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen.